Hey everybody, Charlie Lowe here, publisher of University of Chicago's Public Policy Podcast, or UC3P. I'm happy to be joined by Zareen Hussein today. We just spoke with Professor Tang Biao, and Zareen, would you like to introduce yourself and what brought you to the forum? Of course. Hi everybody, my name is Zareen Hussein, and I am a public policy student at Harris. The reason I brought Professor Tang Biao to the forum is to highlight the Uyghur crisis taking place in Western China. Professor Tang Biao is a human rights lawyer who has worked both in China and the United States and currently teaches in the United States. Yeah, it was a fantastic conversation. We learned a lot about the Uyghur crisis and just as interestingly, Professor Biao's background is fascinating. He has gone through so much in his personal life to achieve and to address systematic injustices that he's seen in his native country. I was really taken by his personal passion and commitment to justice and freedom. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Here is the forum episode with Zareen Hussein and Professor Tang Biao. Good morning, everyone. My name is Zareen Hussein, and I am a public policy student at the University of Chicago. And today, we are speaking with Professor Tang Biao. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. <laughs> Professor Tang Biao is a human rights activist and lawyer, originally from China. Formerly, he was a lecturer at the China University of Political Science and currently a guest lecturer at the University of Chicago at the Posen Center for Human Rights. So, Professor Tang, can you talk us through your journey and what brought you to University of Chicago? Um, after I came to the United States in 2014, I continued my research and my um, activism. And two years ago, uh, Professor Johanna Ransmeer sent me an email and they, are, they were looking for a um, professor who can teach uh, human rights in China here. And I recommended a few scholars and but eventually, they invite me to teach here uh, as a Posen visiting professor. And last year, because of the uh, pandemic, I could teach here remotely. And this year, um, this semester, I came here teaching personally. Brilliant. So speaking of human rights... What made that your field? I know in China, you were a human rights lawyer. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Before I went to a university in Beijing, I was kind of brainwashed. I was born in a very poor family uh, in a remote village. And like the majority of Chinese uh, students in the rural area, in small towns, most of them were brainwashed. And then in the university, I could... Uh, read some books um, published uh, undergroundly, and I met a few professors who could encourage the students to think independently. And then I realized that I had been cheated by the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda for uh, so many years, and I accepted the idea of uh, rule of law, human rights, and liberal democracy, and I decided to promote human rights and rule of law in China. After I got my PhD, I started teaching in the university in Beijing. And at the same time, I started working as a human rights lawyer. That's in early 2003, when a very influential case happened. A young designer was taken away by local police and detained in custody and repatriation center. And then he was tortured to death. And that aroused um, national attention and anger. And because of that, custody and repatriation system was unconstitutional. Then I wrote an uh, open letter together with two other law scholars to the National Congress to challenge the constitutionality of that custody system. A few months later, that system was abolished, and that became the start of the rights defense movement, the Wei Chuan movement. And I was one of the earliest lawyers in this rights defense movement. I 
I founded a couple of human rights organizations and took many sensitive cases related to free speech, religious freedom, torture, death penalty, forced eviction, forced abortion, all those kind of human rights cases or sensitive cases. And that's my work uh, in China as a human rights lawyer, as a scholar and dissident. Absolutely brilliant. And could you name the client on whose case you just mentioned? The case is a, a Sun Zigang case. Interesting. How did that turn out? You mentioned they died in custody. So was your case able to resolve any issue? Yeah, so we used the Constitution and other uh, legal channels to challenge this uh, obviously unconstitutional regulation. And the government also arrested uh, a few people who tortured Sun Zigang. But this case is important because the civil society was them out and then a law was changed and then thousands of those custody and repatriation centers were abolished. And then that's a progress as to personal freedom. We tried to use this case to push forward the constitutional review system in China. We failed but at that time, many people were talking about the constitutional review in China. We don't have the constitutional court or constitutional review system, but we use that case to raise the awareness of the importance of constitutional law. That's very fascinating for me because you're saying that this case started a movement for constitutional change within China. But however, I know during your work, you were detained by the Beijing public security. So it's interesting that you started this and then you had to face some form of backlash. Can you talk us through what happened and why you were detained? Yeah, so we promoted the rights defense movement. The idea is to use the constitution, use the existing legal system to defend people's rights through individual cases. So after Sun Zigan case, after 2003, many human rights lawyers and human rights defenders joined this movement and we founded uh, many human rights organizations. And that rights defense movement became more and more organized and gained more and and more support from the civil society and influence. So that was between 2003 and 2014, 15. And I became defense lawyer in many sensitive cases. And I involved in like a, a torture, wrongful conviction, forced eviction, and the cases of Falun Gong practitioners and Tibetans and Uyghurs. And then the government regarded the human rights lawyers as a dissident, as troublemakers. And then I got a lot of trouble. In the beginning, I was warned by the university I was working at, and then I was banned from teaching for a few times, and I was disbarred. My lawyer's license was revoked, and my passport was confiscated, so I was banned from traveling internationally for five years, and I was put under house arrest by the secret police. When I wanted to organize a conference, or take a case like that, the secret police put me under house arrest. I was not able, not allowed to go out. And I was even kidnapped by the secret police for three times. It's kind of a enforced disappearance. Suddenly, I disappeared. My family, my friends didn't know where I was detained. I myself didn't know where I was detained because when they kidnapped me, they put a hood on my head covering my eyes. And then I was sent to kind of a hotel, but uh, I don't know it uh, whereabout. And they printed the papers, articles I wrote and interviews. And then they asked questions like, why do you criticize the Communist Party? Why do you criticize the human rights violations like that? Why do you take this case? And then they intimidated me to sentence me to five years, 10 years, because they told me your articles, your, your cases and your activities constituted a crime of state subversion or inside of subverting the state power, and that could lead me to 10 years or more. 
And I was tortured, like mentally and physically tortured. I was put under an extreme form of uh, solitary confinement for 70 days. So I was not allowed to read, to write, to make uh, any communication. And I was forced to sit down on the floor in a fixed position from 6 a.m. to 12 midnight. And if I moved a little bit, they would beat me. And I was forced to wear a pair of handcuffs 24-7. That's really brutal, but uh, many human rights lawyers and dissidents in China experience the same torture or even more severe torture. That's an unbelievable story. Thank you for sharing that. I, I couldn't imagine yeah. what you went through. But to get back a little bit to what you were speaking to about feeling brainwashed when you were growing up, was there a specific time or memory in which you realized that everything that you were learning in school was wrong or manipulated? Was there a specific moment or memory that you have that brought you to that moment? Or I started writing diary since when I was uh, in middle school. I was like uh, 13, yeah, 13, 14 years old. And I, I read some of those diaries later. So I, like my dream was building socialism, communism. Yeah. And the teachers told me that the, the communism is the biggest uh, dream you can have. The Chinese Communist Party has always made correct decisions. And it's all for the benefit, the, the interest of Chinese people and the history. So in modern Chinese history, there were many different parties, different groups who want to solve the problems that China was facing. But only the Chinese Communist Party made the right decision. And then China established the People's Republic, a socialist country. Yeah, so there are all these kind of propaganda, this statement. I was not able to challenge all these kind of statement. And students in China are not encouraged to think independently. I have a bit of a broader question about your detainment. What, on a larger scale, what implications does your arrest have with human rights in China? Yeah, many human rights defenders or dissidents in China have been arbitrarily arrested, detained, sometimes like just kidnapped. And the Chinese government uh, frequently put those people into prison or sometimes disappeared them, like writers, bloggers, journalists, scholars, human rights lawyers. That's a clear message that the government is sending to people every day. If you don't obey, if you don't listen to what the party tells you to do, and then you have trouble. The trouble may be you, you lost your job or you disappeared, something like that. And sometimes it's not only you yourself, but also your family, your parents, your children, your wife or husband can also be disappeared or be fired by their working unit. Sometimes they were tortured, and even there were some human rights defenders and dissidents died in custody. So another very famous case of disappearance was with your colleague Ilham Toti. Can you, for those who don't know, tell us a bit more about why was Ilham Toti suddenly arrested? Like your human rights work was labeled as troublesome. What was Ilham Toti doing that made him get life sentence? Ilham Toti is a Uyghur scholar. He's an economist, and he established a blog called uh, Uyghur Biz. He is my close friend. He plays a very important role in, you know, connecting the Han Chinese people and the Uyghurs. He made great effort to promote the mutual understanding between Uyghur people and other people. So, and he's a moderate, uh, not radical at all. And then before he was arrested in 2014, he already had a lot of trouble, uh, intimidated, uh, monitored, followed, and his family were also intimidated and harassed. And then in 2014, he was arrested and later sentenced to life imprisonment. 
that's really a sad story. I uh, after he was、uh, sentenced to life, I wrote an op-ed for the Guardian, saying that Ilham Tokti should not be sentenced to life, but to be given a Nobel Peace Prize. He's a very important scholar and activist. And we know a few years after he was arrested, there were reports that the genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. We know at least one million Uyghurs, Hazaks, and other Turkic people were detained in the concentration camps, and that's really horrifying. That's the worst humanitarian disaster for our time. Yeah, and just to really quickly add on Ilham Toti, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. His accusation was that he was starting a separatist movement so that Xinjiang region would be its own autonomous country called East Turkestan. But we know this is false because his work was always about Uyghurs and Han Chinese working together under the People's Republic of China. But thank you, Professor Tang Biao, for starting this conversation on the Uyghurs. Can you tell us what China is accused of in regards with the Uyghurs and other Turkic minorities? According to the the reports and the researches by independent scholars, think tanks, and media, what's happening in Xinjiang is literally a genocide. At least one million people are being detained in the concentration camps. And the detainees have been systemically brainwashed, tortured. They were forced to learn Chinese or to learn like、uh, propaganda songs. There are reports that at least one、uh, thousand Uyghur people died in custody. I think the real number is much much higher than this because it's extremely difficult and dangerous to get information out. And there were reports, according to the survivors' testimony, the Uyghur women were sexually assaulted and raped. So that's not single case; it's like a systemic rape in the concentration camps. The Uyghur children were forcibly separated from their parents. That's part of the genocide. That the population is decreasing. And the Uyghur language has been limited. Religious activities were limited. Some mosques have been destroyed. The Uyghur language in the shops, the restaurants were removed. And the Chinese government in Xinjiang sent over one million Han Chinese government officials to the Uyghur family, like、uh, closely monitoring what they are doing, what they are saying, like that. And oftentimes, the male members in those families are detained in the concentration camps, and the Han Chinese cadres are sleeping with the other family, the women, children, like that. So that's extremely horrifying, and the government's purpose is to eliminate the cultural, ethnic, and religious identity of the Uyghur people. And why is that? What does China want from the Uyghurs? What challenge do they see the Uyghurs posing their authority? The ISIC uses the Chinese government used to target Uyghur people is. Like they are fighting terrorism, extremism, and separatism, so they label the Uyghur and other ethnic minorities there as terrorists, separatists, and extremists. That's extremely unacceptable because there were some terrorist attacks, but very few. And you can't say a million、uh, Uyghurs are all extremists or terrorists. And so, what the Chinese government wants there is to eliminate all the dissenting voice because the Uyghur people have different language, different religion, different culture with the Han Chinese people, and the Chinese suppression there lasted several centuries. So they and the fundamental freedom and the human rights of the people there were violated. So the Communist Party. Wanted to maintain its、uh, political and social stability, and that's the number one priority of the Chinese Communist Party. That is to maintain its political monopoly, and they don't want to see any threat to that monopoly, that one-party system. 
And that's why the crackdown is so severe there. And that's also the deep reason behind the crackdown in other parts of China, like uh, the roundup of human rights lawyers and the shutdown of non-governmental organizations and the censorship on the internet and the universities. So the, uh, after Xi Jinping came to power in 2013, the human rights situation has been sharply uh, deteriorating. Like many, many friends of mine, bloggers, lawyers, and like uh, feminist uh, NGO activists were arrested, and some of them are still in prison. Really quickly, you talked about the social reasons for the CCP cracking down in Xinjiang, but can you elaborate more on the strategic reasons? Uh, Xinjiang is filled with resources, predominantly cotton and oil. Can you tell us about those reasons why the CCP are interested in Xinjiang? Yeah, the Chinese government exploited in Xinjiang for many years, and many Uyghur people, the local residents, were put under poverty systemically. They take the oil and other important resources from Xinjiang to other parts of China, and then a few years after Xi Jinping became the party secretary, he initiated the Biotender Road Initiative, BRI, and Xinjiang is in the, the most important location of the BRI. So taking resources is an important reason behind that. And also the Chinese Communist Party wants to make sure the stability in Xinjiang because it's the starting point, it's an important location of the BRI. Yeah, and it's interesting because the Belt and Road Initiative involves a lot of countries where Islam is the dominant religion. For example, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the Uyghurs themselves are Muslim. And that's the big differentiation between the Uyghurs and the Han is the Islam religion. So it's interesting that China is building this Belt and Road Initiative with these Islam-dominated countries. Meanwhile, they're doing these crimes against humanities, against the Muslim people. Professor Tank, there are reports coming out that CCP are taking Uyghurs into forced labor camps to work predominantly on cotton. Can you tell us more about the implications that has on global supply chain? Yeah, many, many Uyghur people are being forced to work in uh, different factories, cotton, mine, and some of those factories are not located in Xinjiang, but Jiangsu, Guangzhou, other part of China. And in the concentration camps, the detainees are forced to work a long time a day. And the Chinese government denied the existence of concentration camps. They called these centers as re-education centers or, or vocational training centers. So there are like a direct brazen forced labor in the camps and in some factories, but there are some other forced labor being used, that, which is not so obvious. So if you are a waker and you are being sent to a factory to work, if you don't agree, you'll be sent to the concentration camps. And then you have to go to that factory to work with very, very limited wages. That's also a kind of forced labor. And many global brand uh, Western companies are involving in those supply chains. And there's a campaign against the forced labor and the many international companies are facing pressure from the human rights community. But still, many companies are still there and they prioritize money than the basic principle. And second, we need, I mean, the consumers need more campaign and we need to raise the awareness of the forced labor issue in China, in Xinjiang. If a brand is related to forced labor, we should boycott it. Now, Professor, you mentioned before about some of the issues getting information in and out of Xinjiang. Could you elaborate a little bit more about how people come to learn about these concentration camps and some of the dangers that people go through just to get information out of that part of China? I know many Uyghur friends in the United States and other countries, so they all told me they are not able to contact with their family in Xinjiang. 
so they have been cut off with their families and relatives. If a Uyghur in Xinjiang makes a phone call with their relatives in United States or in Europe or Turkey, it's likely for them to be sent to the concentration camps. If a person in Xinjiang sends out the information about the concentration camps, about the forced labor, torture, something like that, that would be extremely dangerous. So they can be immediately found out and sent to the concentration camps or like indicted and convicted. And not only the whistleblowers are facing extremely dangerous consequence, but also the survivors and journalists in other countries, their family were also punished. Like a famous Uyghur activist, Rusan Nabas, her sister was sentenced to 20 years because of her activism. And Darkun Issa, who is the president of a World Uyghur Congress, he has many family members and relatives in the concentration camps or a prison in China. There are more than 22 family members of the Uyghur journalists working for Radio Free Asia are detained in China. It's like uh, all Uyghur people in China are taken as hostages to silence the Uyghur activists overseas. And there are cases like the Han Chinese, if they support the Uyghurs, if they post some information on social media, they can also be detained. And to back things up just a little bit, what led you to become an activist for the Uyghur cause? In 2009, there was an unrest in Lhasa, we call it July 5th incident, and then a Uyghur journalist was detained, and I went to Ulamuchi trying to defend him. He was sentenced to 15 years, and Ilham Tokti introduced me to his family. But when I came to Xinjiang, his family were intimidated so much that they dared not to hire me as a lawyer. That's my first case of Uyghur people. And I became a close friend of Ilham Tokti. He told me a lot of stories of the suffering of the Uyghur people. So these were before the report of a Uyghur genocide. And in 2017, 2018, I started noticing the report by Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, and Uyghur organizations. And at that time, not many people paid attention to this issue. I knew it's very serious. According to these reports, it was a serious uh, violation of human rights. But only several years later, maybe 2018, 2019, when more evidence, more stories came out, and then the mainstream media and other human rights organizations started their support of the Uyghur people. And then many media report on the Uyghur issue, and some think tanks and scholars uh, categorize it as genocide, and some government and the parliament already uh, recognize it as uh, genocide. Said. But uh, I think if more people could pay attention to the genocide earlier, that would be better. Uh, and I really quickly would like to add, there are only eight countries in the world who have classified this as a genocide, the U.S. being one of them. This past year, there was a tribunal in the United Kingdom that investigated China's alleged genocide and crimes against humanity. Professor Tang, I know you testified at this tribunal. Can you talk us through the process, what evidence you provided, and then the ultimate outcome? The trial was organized by uh, the Waker Tribunal, which is an independent non-government organization. And in London, they organized the three trials. And I was giving testimony in the second trial. There are camp survivors and the former detainees and scholars giving testimony. My testimony was focusing on the political and legal context of the genocide. So the ongoing Uyghur genocide did not emerge from vacuum. There were other similar detentions before this, like Legal Education Center. So the name is a Legal Education Center, but it has nothing to do with legal education. It's like an actual legal detention center targeting Falun Gong practitioners. So there are hundreds of these legal education centers in China 
detaining hundreds of thousands of Falun Gong practitioners. And these Falun Gong people were brainwashed there, were tortured. And according to the report by Falun Gong organization, there are at least 4,600 Falun Gong people being tortured to death. And the Falun Gong believers in those centers were forced to convert. They were forced to give up their belief. My friend Sarah Cook has an article like the Communist Party's learning curve. What's happening in Xinjiang has learned from the Communist Party's treatment of Falun Gong people and Tibetan people. The former head of uh, Xinjiang, Chen Quanguo, used to be the head of Tibet. And in Tibet, he already introduced and intensified the total surveillance and the separation of children, Tibetan children, and the so-called boarding schools. The young kids were forcibly separated with their family, and Tibetan language is limited. And there are also like military-style forced labor camps in Tibet and more than 500,000 Tibetans were in those camps. The Chinese government learned from its treatment of Tibetans and Falun Gong and dissidents, and then they adopted this method in Xinjiang. But what's happening in Xinjiang is more serious, and you know that's literally genocide. And the Uyghur people and Turkey people are being tortured and somehow being killed in those concentration camps. So it's interesting that you mentioned the dependent people, and it seems like systematically these crimes were already being done before the CCP moved on to the Uyghur people. And I bring this up because in 2008, Beijing hosted the Summer Olympics, and there was lots of protests because of China's involvement with Tibet. And just this past month, we concluded the Winter Olympics in China where there was lots of controversy, not just because of what's happening in Xinjiang, but also because of the uniforms the athletes were wearing. A lot of those are sponsored by Nike and Adidas, who are confirmed for having forced labor in their supply chain. So just really quickly, can you just help us understand the significance of the Olympics, both 2008 and 2022, taking place in China? Yeah, Beijing hosted 2008 Summer Olympics, Before that, the Chinese government made a commitment to the international community that they would improve human rights and rule of law in China. But that didn't happen, and the human rights situation was deteriorating before and during and after Beijing Summer Olympics. And also because of the Olympic Games, many people were forced to leave their land and their houses because of the Olympic constructions. And many dissidents and activists were detained before and during Summer Olympics. And then Beijing was allowed to host uh, Winter Olympics this year. And this Olympic, the human rights situation has been worse, much worse than in 2008. And as a human rights activist, I, together with many other human rights organizations, call for the postponement or the cancellation of the Beijing Winter Olympics because what the Chinese government has done in Tibet, in Hong Kong, especially the Uyghur genocide in Xinjiang. But the International Olympic Committee didn't listen and they don't care about uh, human rights in China. So it's really a shame for Fight IOC and the Olympic Games. We also give pressure to the Olympic sponsors and the media who report the Olympic Games. But it's a disappointing that the Olympic sponsors don't want to give up their opportunity to earn money in China from the Olympic Games. That's a big problem. The business, the companies have become complicit in China's suppression of freedom and violation of human rights. An example of pressure that was given to the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, was through the uniforms that was worn by the athletes. Companies like Nike and Adidas are big sponsors, and they're confirmed for having Uyghur forced labor in their supply chain. One way the IOC was pressured was to conduct audits into these supply chains to ensure that there was no Uyghur forced labor. And the report is online and for everyone to see if you are interested. But Professor Tang, I moved on too fast, but I wanted to ask, the Uyghur tribunal that took place in the UK, after your testimony, what were the results? What 
outcome did the tribunal come to? After three rounds of trials, the Uyghur tribunal made the verdict that the Chinese government has committed crime against humanity and genocide. So my follow-up would be, now that it's confirmed by this tribunal that t- there is a genocide taking place, what steps can be done to hold the CCP accountable or essentially bring an end to this genocide? Yeah, genocide is the most severe crime in international legal system. And China, Chinese government should be held accountable. And the International Criminal Court and other platforms should be used to bring Chinese government officials into justice. But, uh, you know, China is the standing member of the Security Council and is a very powerful, aggressive on the international stage. It's not um, easy. It's actually very difficult to hold Chinese government accountable. But we should... You know, there are some some laws and uh, regulations made by the United States and other countries, like a Global Magnitsky Act and like the Uyghur Human Rights Act, the Prevention of Forced Labor Act, like that. And these regulations and laws should be implemented. Like if the company is involved in, in Uyghur forced labor, and then it should be sanctioned. It's also important for for everyone to know what's happening in Xinjiang and to take actions against the Chinese government or the companies in complicity. Like what sort of companies are involved in these human rights violations? Is it everyone who, who does business in China? Are there some bad actors? Uh, could you just walk us through what, you know, what a normal, typical American who might be listening to this podcast can do to address the situation? Actually, many brands are involved in the forced labor. There is a website monitoring all those companies, and they have scores, they have updated information of these companies, like they use Xinjiang cotton. And some, I can double check, but some companies took out their statement of Xinjiang cotton, took out their statement of forced labor policy, and some, like the car maker in Germany, I would like to add that the professor is talking about Volkswagen. Yeah. Which is ironic given how Volkswagen was created. When asked the, the, the Xinjiang Uyghur genocide and the director of the car maker said he knew nothing. He didn't know what happened there. And there are over 88 companies that are complicit in the forced labor, ranging from apparel being the biggest, but all the way down to tech. So if your clothes say made in China, there is a 100% chance that they were made using Uyghur forced labor. We all know that China's ambitions aren't just limited to, you know, controlling its people, but with, you know, working with other countries and asymmetric international development practices with loans and financial tools, complex financial tools that countries don't really fully grasp the severity of, you know, what they're getting into, but also right in their backyard. And obviously, a lot of the news nowadays is focused on Ukraine and Russia. And as that can be seen as a potential proxy that China is looking at for taking control over Taiwan fully. Could you speak to that situation and how it, things are playing out in the modern sense during this you know, early days of the Russia-Ukraine invasion? How the connection between that event and what China sees as a potential opportunity to uh, regain control over Taiwan? Yeah, before that, I may name some companies. So there are many, many brands uh, involving uh, Uyghur forced labor, including BMW, BYD, that's a Chinese car maker, and CK, Cisco, Gap, H&M, Puma, Nike, Adidas, Uniqlo, Zara, yeah, so many, many such brands. And if any consumer want to do something and then they can refuse to buy those products and they can tell their friends, their relatives not to buy. And just really quickly, I'd like to add in 2019, a metric came out to confirm that China is the largest producer of cotton in the world. So back to your question, Charlie, about what implications do the Russian-Ukrainian war have on China's interest in Taiwan? Everyone is talking about Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and many people in the world are supporting Ukraine. 
And China is one of the few countries publicly supporting Putin. And when actually a few hours before Putin invaded Ukraine, Chinese government announced to lift the ban of Russian wheat. And China now is buying more oil, gas, and wheat from Russia. And China refused to call it a war or invasion. So China is giving Putin a lot of financial support and political support. So Xi Jinping is watching the war in Ukraine closely because we can compare Taiwan and Ukraine. Putin's ambition is to take back Ukraine, and he twisted the history of relation between Ukraine and Russia. And the same thing, Chinese government Xi Jinping always says Taiwan is part of China, and they have threatened to militarily attack, occupy Taiwan. So it's still too early to say this ongoing war in Ukraine is encouragement or discouragement to Xi Jinping's decision to invade Taiwan. But we have to support Ukraine and defeat Putin. If Putin occupies Ukraine with impunity, if Putin achieves its political goal in this invasion, and then that would inspire Xi Jinping to invade Taiwan. You said it might be a little too early for Xi Jinping to invade Taiwan, but what about Hong Kong? No, I'm I'm not saying it's too early for Xi Jinping. I'm saying it's too early to say this war in Ukraine is good or bad for Xi Jinping to invade Taiwan. If Putin succeeds, that's an encouragement to Xi Jinping to wage a war against Taiwan. And we know Hong Kong's rule of law and freedom had been taken away. Had been destroyed by Xi Jinping a few years ago in 2019. 2019. The Chinese government, Hong Kong government, crushed the anti-extradition bill protest, and then in July 2020. Beijing passed the national security law in Hong Kong, and then we see the the civil society rule of law and freedom of Hong Kong had been almost completely destroyed. That was happening in front of everyone. We see the disappearance of Hong Kong's freedom, and Beijing wants to do more. To follow up on Hong Kong, as we talked about, this happened mostly in in 2019, and with the government kind of consolidated. What's next for Hong Kong? Do you envision any more pro-democracy protests? Is that still, you know, within the picture, or do you think that the Chinese Communist Party has taken control of the city in a way that isn't going to happen to nearly the same level as we saw in 2019? You know, Hong Kong used to be a very free and prosperous city. Even after 1997, when Hong Kong's sovereignty returned back to Beijing, Hong Kong for more than 15 years, 14 years, remained like a judicial independence and rule of law and active civil society. But now Hong Kong has become part of the People's Republic of China in terms of human rights and freedom. And we should say today, Hong Kong people still enjoy a little bit more freedom than mainland China. And some some people are still trying to defend Hong Kong's limited freedom. But it has become more and more difficult and more and more dangerous. So many of my friends in Hong Kong are in prison now. You know, when I was in China, when I was detained, when my fellow lawyers and dissidents were detained in China, the Hong Kong democracy activists were taking to the street, calling for my release. But now those people, many many of those people, are in Hong Kong prison. That's really unthinkable. Like ten years ago, like the lawyer Albert Ho. Zhou Xingtong and the Long Air and Joshua Wang. So, so many prominent activists in Hong Kong are detained, and it seems that the international community feel powerless. And the international human rights organizations are trying to make statement, criticize the Chinese government, and provide assistance to the Hong Kong refugees. But it's really, really difficult to improve Hong Kong's situation, and you know most people are pessimistic about Hong Kong's future. 
that's closely related to China's political transition. If China is under the rule of the Communist Party, if China not democratized, I think it's、um, not possible for Hong Kong people to enjoy freedom and democracy. That's really powerful stuff, Professor. I don't want to necessarily leave it on on that kind of a note. But point being, you're here at the University of Chicago. For those of you listening who are at the University of Chicago, what can they look forward to having you on campus? What kind of classes are you teaching? Can you kind of walk us through what exactly you're doing here at U Chicago? Last year, I taught at University of Chicago remotely. I taught human rights in China, and I organized、uh, uh, several panel discussions on Tibet,、uh, Uyghur, Hong Kong. And this year, I teach here in person. I really enjoy the conversations with my students and the events I organized. So I organized a couple of panels this year. One is about、uh, Beijing Olympics and the human rights in China. Another is China's high technology totalitarianism.、Mm-hmm. And Professor Tom Ginsberg and I were speakers. I admit this university many years ago, so it's really my honor and pleasure to teach here. Well, it's our honor to have you here and to speak with you. This fantastic conversation. Thank you very much, Professor Tang. And just really quickly, I'd like to ask: outside of University of Chicago, what works are you doing? I'm organizing a conference、uh, focusing on the Uyghur genocide. I invited leading scholars and activists in this field. It will be May the second at Hunter College, City University of New York. And it is in person event, so I hope this conference could let more people know、uh, what's happening in Xinjiang and what the international community can do and should do. Brilliant! Thank you so much, Professor Tang, for speaking with us today, and thank you to our audience for listening to us. For more information on what's going on in China with Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Tibet, Professor Tang, where can we find information for our own personal research? Yeah, there are many、uh, human rights organizations. They have website. They have report like Uyghur Human Rights Project, the World Uyghur Congress, and like、uh, Chinese Human Rights Defenders、uh, (CHRD), Human Rights in China Safeguard Defenders, and you can look for those information on the website of the human rights organizations, including like international organizations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and Freedom House. And there are some some interesting discussions on the China file and bitter winter. Some mainstream、uh, newspaper also have a Chinese version, and they have more and more reports related to China, like New York Times, Financial Times, Washington Post. That's fantastic, Professor Heng Biao. Thank you so much. This has been the forum presented by University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. And with that, thus concludes another episode. Thank you again for joining us on this episode of the forum.、Uh, another big thank you to Zareen Hussain and Professor Tang Biao for their contributions, conversation, and insights into the Uyghur crisis in China. Big thank you to Cole Van Glan and Ibrahim Rashid, the editors here at UC3P. Until next time, this is Charlie Lo signing off.